Luke chapter 2 is very unique, actually, in the Gospels, because it is where we learn in detail what happened at the birth of Jesus Christ. And I think this is another place where we can conclude that Dr. Luke, who wrote this Gospel, talked to some of the very important players in the life of Jesus Christ, including, very possibly, Jesus' mother Mary because we get this very detailed story of what took place at the birth of Christ. It's also the only place where we see Jesus presented for circumcision at the temple in Jerusalem, and it's the only gospel that gives us this tiny but very significant story of Jesus as a 12-year-old boy. Now, the first 20 verses of this chapter... You most will sound most familiar to you, and many of you may actually have it memorized. I know that as a child, on Christmas Eve every year, we would one of the last things that we would do before we went to bed and waited for what Santa Claus was going to bring us, is we would sit down and we would open up Luke chapter 2, and we would read the Christmas story. And if you've ever watched the Charlie Brown Christmas special, they always read the Luke chapter 2 Christmas story. And so it's one of those things that's just embedded in our mind. And when we start saying, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus and all this, we go, oh, yeah. We start smelling pine and, uh, and fir trees, and we, and, we, and we start hearing Christmas carols echoing in our minds. Well, what I want to do this morning as we go through these verses is to kind of forget all that if you can. Push it out of your minds and think about the people that didn't have the benefit of Christmas trees and, and, uh, and all of the, the holiday regalia that we surround Christmas with, they were experiencing it for the very first time. And it turned out to be a glorious time, but also a very difficult time as well. So let's begin here in verse 1 of chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, if you remember, the Roman world at that time, Palestine and Israel was under the rule of the Roman government. And the, the Caesar, the emperor of those days, was Caesar Augustus. And he ruled the area from Rome. Now, believe it or not, this paragraph right here has caused a lot of controversy. And a lot of people use this as a reason not to believe in the Bible, believe it or not. Because they say that it's not accurate when you look back in history. They say that there was never any empire-wide census that Caesar Augustus called. And there was no reason, if there, even if there had been a census, there was no reason for Joseph to go to Bethlehem to register. During these Roman census, you could register wherever you were. That just wasn't that important. And furthermore, even if he did go to Bethlehem, there was no reason for him to take his wife, his betrothed, Mary. They could, he could have just gone by himself and registered there. And in fact, fourthly, Quirinius wasn't even governor at this time of Syria. So they conclude, the Bible is simply a made-up afterward version of events that seemed plausible, but not factual. Well, okay, let's talk about that. In case you ever run into anybody who tells you that Luke chapter 2 is proof that the Bible is not real. It is true that Caesar Augustus did not call for an empire-wide census during this period of time. However, he had put forth a policy that allowed for regional census taking and taxation. And, in fact, there was a regional census in Palestine taken during this time. So, point one. Secondly, although it wasn't a Roman requirement for men to return to their hometown in order to register, it was a Jewish custom during times of registration 
for the men to return to their ancestral towns. And Joseph drew his line back to David, whose town was Bethlehem. Point number two. Um, Quirinius was not governor at the time of this census. He was, um, and, but it was quite possible that he was an administrator, in fact, the administrator of this regional census. But it wasn't like in our day. In our day, today, here in America, we take a census every 10 years. And you have people that get hired as census takers, and they go around to people's homes, and they type things in a computer, and they take it back to Washington, D.C., and then out comes the census, and it's very quick. Not like that in those days. Census taking, which then went to taxation, took a very long time to complete. And so it's quite possible that Quirinius was the administrator during this census, but later he did become governor. So even though the times don't match, it still matches for what's taking place here. And then as far as Joseph bringing Mary to Bethlehem along with him, let me give you this idea. Realizing that Mary was close to giving birth, also realizing the importance of what was taking place in Mary's womb, I don't think Joseph would have left her behind for anything. I don't think I would go traveling to a different place, many miles away, not able to hop on a 737 and rush back at a moment's notice if my wife were about ready to give birth to a child. So I think it's quite not only plausible, I think it is what, the way that it actually happened. So this is an example of where people will poke fun at the Bible and say it's all made up, but it's because they don't look at it deeply enough. Look at the context, look at the history of what's going on, look at what is taking place in this family. So this is, I think, exactly what happened. Uh, some other things. We think of Joseph and Mary all alone with their donkey, and they're trudging up the, uh, the dirt path to Bethlehem, and it's Christmas Eve, you know, and all this sort of stuff. Well, probably they didn't arrive in Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. It says, while they were there, she gave birth. And the idea is that she, they probably arrived some days or even weeks before the birth took place. And that while they were there in Bethlehem, she gave birth to Jesus. Another thing, a lot of times we think of uh, Jesus being laid in some sort of a wooden um, crib. And, and they're in a, kind of a, a wooden cow shed or something and, and you have the... The shepherds and the donkeys and the sheep and, and the, the angels and the magi and, and everything's kind of surrounded with this holy glow, you know, kind of a, the crash scene, you know, whatever crash as well. Hate to burst your bubble, it really wasn't like that. As a matter of fact, when it says that Jesus was laid in a manger, that word actually means feeding trough. So Jesus was laid in a feeding trough, not made of wood, Wood was not plentiful as it is here in the Pacific Northwest. This feeding trough was most likely made out of stone. Not a suggestion for you young parents to be laying your babies in a stone feeding trough. But there wasn't anything else for them to do. He says there was no room for them at the inn. But the innkeeper must have taken some sort of mercy on them and said, Well, you know, I got this cave out back. It's not particularly warm and it's not particularly clean, but you know, hey... Uh, I don't have any room for you, so you can go out there and use that. And so they went into a cave in the hillside and cleaned out a feeding trough, and that's where they had to lay their son, Jesus. Interestingly enough, that site in Bethlehem is probably one of the only accurate sites of the life of Jesus that exists in Israel today. If you go over to Israel... They will take you to a place called the Garden Tomb. And it's, a, it's beautiful. It's a great place to meditate on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a, it's a tomb in a, in a wall. and It's a beautiful garden and all this. But it's probably not the tomb that Jesus was in. They will take you to uh, churches. And they claim to be the place where Christ was crucified. Probably not. Reason is because so many years passed before people really went back. And you know how things go. Things get built up over the top. Things get torn down. There are wars. And actually in 70 AD, not too long after Jesus was crucified, 
the Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem. But just a short while after, somebody came in looking for the birthplace of Jesus Christ. And they pointed them to this cave in Bethlehem. And so scholars believe this may be the real site where Jesus was born. I've been there. Margaret and I were there. There's a church built over the top of it, of course. And you kind of go down into this place, and, and um, it's kind of surreal. It's, it's a little bit churchified. you got lots of incense and candles and, you know, things like that. In fact, they have this little uh, brass star in the place where they think that Jesus was laid in the manger or something. And I'm sure there was no brass star there when <clears throat> Joseph and Mary were there. But anyway, a cave in a hillside. It's, it's no... Oregon Health Sciences University Maternity Ward. It, it's no hospital room. It's, it's not even a nice motel or anything. It was a dirty, dark, dank place where Jesus was born. And I like that. The king of the universe was born in not a palace, not a luxurious home, not a hospital, but in the crummiest of places, attended by the lowliest of people. Because Jesus came to this world to save everyone, not just those who were the high and the mighty. Verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out of the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Now, once again, we have this kind of romantic view of the shepherds. I, I kind of always thought, thought of them sort of like American cowboys, you know, out there on the prairie. They've got the fire going, you know, and the coffee pot with like three-day-old three coffee uh, brewing on there, you know, and... Instead of the lowing of cattle in the background, they have the bleeding of sheep. But, you know, other than that, it's, it's pretty much the same thing and, <coughs> and all that. Well, um, you need to throw that out of your mind. The life of a shepherd was not the romantic life of a cowboy. In fact, the shepherds at that time were really considered outcasts in their society. They were not even allowed to enter into cities, and most of them were, were considered to be thieves. Now, I know shepherds today are not considered outcasts. They are allowed in cities, and they are not considered thieves. Right? <laughs> Since you guys raised sheep, I thought I would throw that in for your memory. <laughs> Moving along. <laughs> but you know, for God to send his angels to announce the birth of the King of Kings to these guys out in the fields would kind of be like God sending an angel today to the homeless in downtown Portland. And you think, well, God, I was available. Why didn't you come and tell me? You went to these guys, you know, who cares about them? They're, they're just no people. They're no names. We don't care about them. Well, God cares about them, and God cared about these shepherds. Now, of course, there was a lot of symbolism involved in this, because Jesus Christ was to be the Lamb of God, slain before the foundations of the earth. And the shepherds out there in the fields outside of Bethlehem, they were raising sheep all right. 
And they themselves might have been considered outcasts, but those lambs that they raised ended up being used in the sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem, all of which symbolized and signified this sacrifice that would take place. The Passover lamb that would die not just to symbolize God rescuing his people from death, but actually rescuing his people. And so I think it's neat that attending his birth were shepherds that raised lambs for the sacrifices in Jerusalem. I think that's very cool. I think it's probably Gabriel, although he's not identified here. Gabriel, we saw last time in chapter 1, came to uh, Zechariah and, and, and announced the birth of John the Baptist. We think he came to Mary and announced that she would become pregnant with Jesus Christ. And so it's most likely that this was Gabriel who came to announce the birth, this good news. He says, I, I bring good news. And it's the word gospel. That's what the gospel is. It's good news. It's good news that the angel brings. He says he, he, he brings it to all the people. Actually, the Greek word that's used there refers to the people of Israel. Now, that doesn't mean that the good news of Jesus Christ isn't for everyone in the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But Jesus did come to the nation of Israel first. And then from there, it was to branch out to uh, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Now, the angel says he is bringing good news about a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And we kind of just, you know, we know that from the Christmas story, so we just sort of glaze over it. I guarantee you good news this day is born to you. Savior who is Christ the Lord. You know, we all know it. We can, but we don't realize the significance of the amazing statement that this angel is making. Savior literally means deliverer. And that would have been, that would have meant the same thing to the, both the Greek and the Hebrew audience that were reading this, the Jews and also the Greeks. He says, he is Christ, which means anointed one, or in Hebrew, uh, Messiah. And he says he's the Lord, which signifies that he is deity. Now this is amazing stuff that he's saying to these people. You have God himself as the one set apart for the specific task of delivering his people. That's what the angel is saying. That's a pretty amazing statement. Now the shepherds didn't ask for a sign of what was going to take place. But the angel gave them one anyway. And it's a very specific <coughs> one. And it wasn't the swaddling clothes. And it wasn't necessarily the manger. But it was the combination of the two <coughs> swaddling clothes... Are, we still do that to this day. When our kids were born, the nurses in the hospital took those pretty baby blankets, two blue and a pink for us, you know, two boys and a girl. And, and you know how they do that, they, and I don't, it must be a skill they learn in nursing school. And moms know this just instinctively, I think. But they, they wrap them up and they do some weird fold with the, with the cloth so that their arms are all held in place, you know, and they can't move. And I was restrictive is that? The poor kid, you know, is all folded up in this blanket. But what they told me was the child likes that because they have just come out of the security and closeness of the mother's womb. And so in those days, they would wrap them in cloths like that as well. So that was a pretty common thing. And of course, shepherds would have known about mangers. Yeah, we know what that is. We put our, our hay or straw or whatever kind of feed we use for our... What do you, what do you feed sheep? Hay. Hey. All right. Works for me. So, but to say you will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger, they're going, what? What kind of sign is that? Well, okay, at least it'd be easy to, to spot. Um, and he, he, he says, I mean, by saying that it's in a manger, he gives them a clue about where to look, right? Um, they aren't going to go to Bethlehem and go knocking on the, the, the giant house that may be there, where the rich people live, that's not where they're going to find Jesus. They're not going to find Jesus at the inn. They're going to find Jesus in a place where animals are being fed. And so they go quick, and they find Jesus in this place where they can go, which is good. And Jesus is always found in a place where we can go. 
You can reach Jesus. He's reachable by you. You don't have to be an honorable, super righteous, have your act all together, be part of the jet set and the high and mighty and the rich and famous. You can be the crummiest, lowliest, sinful person in the whole world, but Jesus is in a place where you can find him. And they go and they and it says they make haste. The the angel says, You can you can find him, you know? Check it out, man. Go find this guy. And so they do. And then it says they made known what they saw and they heard. And it means to declare something that you know. They were like the first ambassadors of the gospel. They went out and told something worth telling. And it says the people who heard it both wondered and marveled at, what the, at the thing that the shepherds said. And it, and it means to admire, and I really love the root word that comes from, to look closely at. So this wasn't like, hey, you know, this heavenly being came and told us that we would find a baby in Bethlehem, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger, and that this would be Christ Lord, this would be the Messiah. And they said, oh, that's nice. Well, where'd you get that feed? I really like that. You know, was that down at uh, Home uh, Farm Depot or whatever? <laughs> no, no. This was an amazing thing they were telling. And the people looked closely at it. They probably asked these shepherds questions. You mean the Messiah? Messiah? You saw Messiah? Yeah. And it says that Mary treasured these things, treasured the experience. It means to, um, to confer. In a way, you could say she mulled them over. She thought about them a lot. Mary was a very thoughtful person. She listened when the angel talked to her and told her what was going to happen. She listened when the shepherds came. And in a few verses here, she's going to listen to again to some news that's not so great. But she took all these things in and she, she mulled them over and she thought about them. I like that. Okay, verse 21. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, or Joshua, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now this short little paragraph here actually could have encompassed three different ceremonies that were common to the Jews in that day. And the first one comes out of Leviticus chapter 12 verse 3 that says male boys must be circumcised on the eighth day. Now they didn't necessarily have to go to Jerusalem for this one, although they could have. A local priest there in Bethlehem could have performed the rite of circumcision for them. And at that point is when the child is named. And so, in obedience to what the angel told Mary and Joseph, they named this baby Jesus. Actually, that's the Greek translation of the word Joshua, which was the name that he was given in Hebrew. Very, very common name there in, um, in Israel at the time. Because Jesus came from the common people. For us, the common people. Then a month later, Numbers chapter 18 verse 15 tells the Jews that the firstborn male of every household belongs to God and must be redeemed by sacrificing a lamb or if the family was too poor, they could do it with doves. Now the reason for this is again tying into the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God. The Passover, which is when God rescued his people out of the nation of Egypt, he was going to kill the firstborn male of every household, period. The only way to escape it was to sacrifice a lamb without spot or blemish and take the blood and paint it on the doorposts. And then the angel of death would pass over that house and wouldn't kill the firstborn male. Thus is born Passover. And so after that, God said... All the firstborn male children belong to me. In fact, he said all the firstborn male animals belong to me as well. They belong to me. I bought them on Passover. And so that law kept, go, kept on. He said, this is what you've got to do. In fact, if they didn't, 
redeem him by a sacrifice, the law says that person would be killed. Now, there's no record of anybody being killed, so I'm sure they were all redeemed. But you can see the firstborn male child being redeemed, and that's what Jesus was done. They were poor. They were a poor young couple, and so they took a couple of turtle doves, which the law allowed them to do in order to redeem this child. Later on, though, I find it very interesting that Jesus was redeemed by the sacrifice according to the law. But 30 years later, 33 years later, he would voluntarily lay down his life as the sacrifice. He would be killed in order to save us from our sins. I love that. So that took place a month after his birth. Then 10 days later, 40 days, Mary would also have to go to the temple. And that's because the law says that a woman was unclean for 40 days after giving birth. And that just it didn't, we, we tend to think, you know, she's unclean. That means she's bad. That's not what that means. It just means that she couldn't take place in religious ceremonies for those 40 days until she became ceremonially, ceremonially clean by offering a sacrifice. And again, it could be two turtle doves or two pigeons that could be used in place of a lamb. Now, it's possible that these events all took place at the same time. We don't really know. Luke kind of just kind of all gloms them together. They could, have take, they could have stayed in Jerusalem for those 10 days between the 30th and the 40th day. But anyway, an interesting, things, an interesting thing happens while they're there. A couple of people come and meet them. I mean, who is Mary and Joseph? They're just this young couple, and they're just nobodies. They come into the temple, they're doing their duty according to the law. And verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, look what happens. He took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts will be revealed. Imagine you are Mary and Joseph, and you come walking into the temple... You're just minding your own business, and here comes this person up to you saying all these things. Pretty incredible. This guy is Simon. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, it says. Basically, that means he was waiting for the Messiah. And somehow God <coughs> told him, Simeon, you're not going to come to be with me until you see the Messiah. Wow, that's really quite an incredible promise, I think. So then one day he says, Simeon, I want you to go to the temple today. Okay, Lord. So then he goes, and he sees this child. And there are several times when this takes place. When Elizabeth greets Mary. When John the Baptist, that son, sees Jesus coming to be baptized, which we'll see in a few chapters. And when Simeon comes to the temple, he sees this child and knows that it is the Messiah. And he says it is a light for revelation to the Gentiles. I like that. Luke wrote to a Gentile audience, to us. And it's a light for revelation to us. I, I like that a lot. And so, you know, just as Mary and, and Joseph are then rejoicing, you know, this guy comes along, picks up their baby. Mothers are usually pretty protective of their newborn babies. But here comes Simeon, picks up the baby and says this incredible thing. And then he says something more, something very troubling. Jesus would bring salvation, yes, but he would also bring division which was true. Jesus himself said, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. And it would divide people because they would have to make a decision. Do I acknowledge my sinfulness and repent of those things and give my life to God through the sacrifice of this man, Jesus, or do I reject him? 
And then he also says that for Mary, this great blessing of salvation would come at great sorrow for her, and it did. She watched her son die, executed. And I wonder how often do God's greatest blessings come at an incredible price for his saints. So that's not all. Verse 36, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, and she was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin. And then as a widow until she was 84. Or it could be rendered that she was a widow for 84 years. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. So by some accounts, this woman Anna is 105 years old. And you're thinking, that's impossible. Actually, it's not. There are historic records from that day of Jewish women who lived to be 105 years old. <coughs> um, in fact, there was a woman at that time that Jewish literature records being that old. Could it have been this person? It's possible. It's extra biblical evidence. But anyway, she, she didn't actually live at the temple. It kind of suggests that she's there night and day like, like she never left the temple. But whenever the temple was open for worship, that's where she was. And we don't know exactly what she said. It's not recorded for us. But um, she apparently spreads this word about this Messiah, Jesus, to her friends and for all those who were waiting for God to restore the nation. This is a lot to take in for a young couple from Nazareth. Pretty mind-blowing. Verse 39. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned it to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So Mary and Joseph go back to Nazareth, to where they've been living, and, and here's this little snippet of, of information about Jesus' youth. It says that he grew strong. Now, the word grew refers to physical strength. And remember, Joseph was a carpenter, so Jesus is being brought up in, as a carpenter, and he was physically strong, but it also, the word strength there actually refers to spiritual strength. We also know that he was really wise beyond his years, and it was obvious that God was with him. Isn't that what we ask as parents for our kids as well? That they would grow, they'd be strong physically, but strong spiritually, and that the Lord would be strong in them? We're going to see that here more right now, verse 41. It's this little tiny thing of Jesus' youth. Now he's 12 years old. Zoom, 12 years in the future. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. So this is like probably the 12th time that Jesus has been to Jerusalem for the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But when they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. You can imagine the anxiety. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. You can hear the edge in Mary's voice. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother, here we go again, treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. It almost sounds from this story, doesn't it, that they went up when Jesus was 12, and Jesus didn't tell his parents he was staying behind, and then he just kind of slipped away, and they left town, and then they got all upset at him because he wasn't there, and came back and scolded him about it. 
you could almost argue that Jesus was being disobedient and rebellious and and this was, you know, this, this is the Savior? Okay, again, we have to understand what's going on in this situation. Jesus, 12 years old. How significant is that? That's the age at which Jewish boys became men. When the families that would go up in large groups, mostly for protection against the many thieves and robbers, and highway robber, robberies that took place on the road to Jerusalem, they would go up in these groups. The men and the children under 12 years old would go up in the front, and the men would follow along behind. Two separate groups. Jesus was 12 years old. He could have been in either group. He wasn't yet a man. He wasn't quite a boy. So when the group left, it's quite possible that Mary and Joseph, both of them being separated, wouldn't have known. They would, you know, Mary would have thought, oh, Jesus must be up with, up with Joseph, and Joseph would have thought, oh, Jesus must be back with Mary and the other women. So they get away, a day away, and I'm sure they were setting up camp for the night or something, and, you know, Joseph, can you go call Jesus to dinner? You know, I got dinner laid out here, and, and I really want to eat it. And they, they start asking around, where's Jesus? Wasn't he with you? I thought he was with you. And they begin, as all parents would, to become very upset. And so they say, you know what? You guys go on home. We're going to head back to Jerusalem. We're going to look for Jesus. And, you, and I'm sure you can imagine the conversation that must have been going back and forth between Mary and Joseph. How could Jesus have done this? You know, he's been such a good boy. And they're getting all uptight, you know, and as parents do. They're getting more anxious, perhaps a little bit angry. And they go back to Jerusalem, and they look around and look around. They finally go to the temple, and here's Jesus. He's not running around with the boys, getting into mischief. He's at church. <laughs> He's sitting around with the, with the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests. And what are they doing? They're talking theology. They're talking about the scriptures. And not only that, but these guys are going, Man, I didn't realize he knew that. How, this kid's 12 years old. How can he know that stuff? And, and he's asking them questions that are going, Well, boy, I don't know if I know the answer to that question. So here's the scene that... Mary and Joseph come back into, and, and, and they say, you know, why did you, why did, have you treated us so? And what would Jesus answer to them? He says, why were you looking for me? Why were you looking for me? Do you not know that I must be in my Father's house? Now, this is pretty significant. I think that Jesus was well aware at this time that he was indeed the Messiah. He says, my father's house, that's not Joseph's house, guys. That's the temple. That would be God the Father. And for him to say, God is my father at this time, is to me pretty clear evidence that Jesus knew full well who he was at 12 years of age. In fact, I have a feeling based on this little story right here that Jesus was perfectly ready to begin his ministry as the Messiah right then and there. It just wasn't time yet. <clears throat> and we'll get to this as we see the baptism of Jesus when the Holy Spirit comes upon him. And most of the time, we think that's when Jesus got the power to be the Messiah. And a lot of people even teach, in fact, that Jesus was just an ordinary man, and at his baptism, the Holy Spirit came upon him and made him so that he could be the Messiah. I don't think that's true. He was born the Messiah. He knew he was the Son of God. He could have acted out of his public ministry right then, but it wasn't the right time. And so it says that he went back with his parents. He was submissive to them. We don't hear of any other stories of him doing anything else out of the ordinary. In fact, for the next 18 years, we don't hear anything at all about Jesus. Except we figure that Joseph probably died at some point during this time. That Jesus was well loved. And that he grew up as a fairly normal person. Experiencing all the things that we experience as we're growing up and become adolescents and then adults. Jesus led an ordinary life. But he was a very, very special child. I think that Luke's account here shows us that you know, Jesus had a typical upbringing for a Jewish boy in the first century. And as he grew, it's obvious that he began to explore what God was doing through him. Now, I don't at all mean to denigrate his deity. I think he knew he was the Son of God. But he was also fully man. 
And why is that important? Again, we come back to talking about how Jesus came to the ordinary people. Jesus was an ordinary Jewish boy in many respects. And in the book of Hebrews, it says, We do not have a high priest, which refers to Jesus Christ, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He went through all the stuff that we go through. We can't think of God as just up in heaven. You know, God, you don't know what I have to go through. You don't know what temptations I face. You don't know what it's like to live my life. Well, you know what? He does. A word to parents, I guess, through this. Watch for your child's special relationship with the father. Encourage it. Encourage them to ask questions and answer those questions about spiritual things. And here's a tip. Don't scold them when they might appear more radical than you in the things of God. I kind of experienced that where, where, where my family didn't understand when I became a Christian. And really, I, I really got on fire for God. It was just treated as weirdness. I encourage you not to do that. If your children are really on fire for God, as long as they're biblically sound in what they're, in what they're uh, believing, encourage them. Get behind them. Support them. Another thing I think we can see from this chapter here is that God moves mighty men, whether they like it or not. You know, Caesar Augustus was not sitting on his throne in Rome going, I want to think about a way to please the Lord God of the universe, and so I'm going to make a policy of census taking and taxation so that the Messiah can be born in Bethlehem and I will be part of God's grand plan. I don't think so. I think Caesar was sitting here on his throne going, how can I make more money? How can I solidify my power? So, I'll make this policy for census taking so that I can get more money from all these different territories that I am in charge of. I'm sure that the Syrian officials who called on this Palestinian census that took place, they weren't looking forward to finding out where the Messiah was going to be born. They were looking forward to becoming rich off the taxes that were collected. Nobody was thinking about this poor little couple the carpenter from Nazareth and his out of wedlock but betrothed and pregnant wife making their way to Bethlehem. They were on no one's radar scope. They were in no one's top ten list. There were no paparazzi following them along as they went to Bethlehem waiting for the blessed event to take place. And yet God can use the selfish acts of evil men to accomplish the will of a selfless, holy, and loving God. Why do I say that? Because he can do that in your life too. we got a lot of selfish, evil people around us, some of whom work in governments and want to pass laws and do things to make our lives difficult. And we have evil people that are around us that do things, they fire us, they make our jobs difficult, they make our lives difficult, they say things about us, they do things to try and hurt us. But does it really matter? I want to encourage you to take heart by what happened to Mary and Joseph. God got them where they needed to be, when they needed to be, no matter what anybody else was trying to do. In fact, he used those things to bring them to the place where Scripture says the Messiah would be born. And for our lives, no matter what any evil person tries to do to you, God can use it to work together for good in your life as well. Now, that doesn't mean that we just hunker down and don't do anything and say, okay, well, God's going to move. I'll just wait. Well, waiting is good. We should vote. We should make our opinion known. More importantly, we should pray. James, the apostle, said you have not because you ask not. God wants us to ask for things. But don't fret over what evil people will do to you because God is the one who is in control. Psalm 118 says, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Later, Jesus would say, don't fear men who are able to destroy the body, but fear God who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. He's the one that we need to be reckoned to. He's the one that we need to belong to. Another thing to look at in this chapter here 
God moves in the hearts of men by inviting them to look for and find the Savior. God moves in the hearts of men and women by inviting them to look for and find the Savior. That's what he did in the shepherds. He didn't have to. You're a shepherd. You're sitting by the fire. You close your eyes. And then the next moment, your eyes are open. You're on your knees in front of the manger and you're bowing down to the Messiah. He could have done that. He could have transported those people, and he would have—I mean—he could have transported every king in the whole world, and then they would have been bowing in front of him. He didn't do it. He came to some outcast people, and he said, "I want you to go look for and find the Messiah." Now, later on, we read in John chapter one that a guy named Philip tells another guy named Nathaniel about Jesus. And Nathaniel says, he says, you know, this Jesus is Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip says to him, come and see. Come and see. It's an invitation. God doesn't force himself on anybody. He could, but he doesn't. He invites. In fact, the book of the Revelation, chapter 3 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come into him. And, and he says that God will make his abode in us. He will live in us. But it's always an invitation for us to come and see. I would encourage anybody who does not yet know this Joshua, this Yeshua, this Savior, to come and see what he's really like, what he really says, what he really has to offer. Don't believe all the garbage that's being told about him in the world. Especially right now, folks. This big movie that's supposed to be the greatest thing, Da Vinci Code. It's fiction. I write fiction. I know the difference between making up a story and looking at the truth. That's not the truth. We can certainly get into a discussion on that if you want to. It's garbage. It is garbage. This isn't garbage, the Word of God. This is where we need to look. This is where we need to search for and find the Messiah. Not in novels of fiction in the world, but in the Word of God that He shared with us. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that Your truth, Your will, happened no matter what people tried to do to stop it. You worked an entire empire around one evening in the lives of two people so that your son could be born where you wanted him to be. And I know that, Lord, in our lives, if it's your will, you can move heaven and earth so that what you want in us will be accomplished. And we take great comfort in that, Lord, because oftentimes our world seem like they are out of control, spinning around, events taking place that are just hurting us and whipping us around and putting us down. And we don't feel like anything is going to work out at all. So we take comfort this morning in the fact that you will work it out. You cause all things to work together for the good to those who, are, who love you and are called according to your name. And we call on your name this morning, Lord, to take those things about which we are concerned about and work your will in those things. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you in Jesus' name.